everyone, it's Victoria Lambert here. I'm Education and Careers Editor at The Telegraph. Um, welcome to the final session of our series Back to School um, in association with Pearson. As a provider of learning resources and qualifications, Pearson has been working hard to develop new resources to support learning at home. My first panellist is Dr. Narina Ramlikan. Narina has more than 25 years experience as a physiologist and sleep expert. She currently coaches on burnout prevention at Ashbridge Vision School and has several published works on sleep problems and how to resolve them. Hi, Narina. Hi, Victoria. <laughs> also joining me is Vicky Bingham. Vicky is the head at Southampton High School and has previously worked as a deputy head and head of classics. During her time as a classics teacher, she discovered a love of the spoken word and has gone on to couch to coach countless students to success. Hi, Vicky. Hello. Hi. Right, well, welcome everyone. Um, we're going to dive straight into the questions. And the first question I'm going to ask is, I'm going to aim it to Vicky, and I'm going to say Elaine Cowan has asked, year 11 students are confused how the exams will change. Should they continue to study and revise the whole syllabus for every subject? Um, that's a really pertinent question. Um, we're still obviously waiting at this stage for um, some more detailed news from the Department for Education about specifically the exams timetable. Um, and what we're expecting to see is probably some sort of delay to the exams timetable by perhaps three or four weeks. But in terms of the content, um, your, your child's school should ultimately, when they know all the details from all the different exam boards, I'd be expecting that they'd be communicating that to um, year 11 students and perhaps their parents as well. Um, but essentially the changes will be positive changes. Um, they're certainly not going to be adding any more to the syllabus. In some subjects, the syllabus has been reduced. Um, I think the question is whether it's been reduced enough. Um, but to give you some examples, in art, for example, they've um, removed the requirement for the exam and now it's all going to be based on portfolio. In uh, languages, uh, there isn't going to be an oral exam any longer and there's going to be a spoken endorsement instead done by the teachers. Um, in English, I know there's been quite a bit of controversy about AQA English specifically because they've kept the Shakespeare and the poetry as compulsory modules. And of course, what schools were hoping is that they might save teaching time. Uh, but generally, I would say the changes are going to be beneficial to students. Um, some subjects have seen very little change at all. Um, but I hope that's, that provides some reassurance. And I'm sure that children's schools will be in touch with all the candidates to make sure that they understand all the different changes for every single uh, specification. Can, can you see it? Um that the um, government might even cancel GCSEs. Is that anywhere on the agenda? Um, well, that's a really interesting question. Um, separately to all of this and the question about whether exams will happen or not uh, this academic year, there's also a group of schools across the different sectors, across um, the state sector and the private sector, um, supported, I think, by Kenneth Baker, um, former um, Secretary of State for Education, to actually remove GCSEs as a qualification altogether. However, that's a much longer term strategy. In terms of whether they happen this year or not, um, I think the government is really pulled in so many different directions here. They know that the exams debacle for the, the A-level students, at least last year, was um, uh, chaotic. Mm. Um, the algorithm didn't work. It hadn't been properly scrutinized um, despite warnings. Um, so I think they're quite keen to see exams to happen. That would be my assessment. Yeah. Uh, but then they've also got schools and some head teachers putting pressure on them not to have exams because, of course, some students have missed so much learning. Um, so I think the question is whether they've cut the content enough to enable students. My feeling as a head is, yes, we'll probably get this announcement soon in October about whether exams are going to go ahead or not and what the timetable will look like. I think what we've all got to tackle as, as head teachers, as teachers, as parents, is that sort of sense of ongoing uncertainty. Mm -hmm. So even if we get that announcement in October, how confident are we going to be feeling about exams come February or March? Mm -hmm. My personal view is I would really, really like them to go ahead because I think um, the alternative is, is, is messy and um, arguably unfair for all sorts of different reasons. 
Um, Norena, actually, I can bring you in this a little bit because your daughter's just been through the GCSEs, hasn't she? Yes, she has. Yes. And how did, she find, how did she find having them sort of taken away from her, that the exams taken away she was, from her? She was very, uh, she was very disappointed. Yeah. And I'll go so far as to say she actually felt quite depressed about it. Um, and she, you know, she, she she likes studying. My daughter likes school. She likes doing well. <laughs> so I think for her, it was a sort of, I watched at the beginning of lockdown where she rearranged her room and like a lot of the kids, coloured her hair pink or blue. Yeah. Or it was at one point and started doing more art and then I saw her sort of her motivation and purpose starting to sort of really dwindle yeah. um, so by the time that you know the results were, were announced I think she was feeling uh, quite a low ebb with it very disappointed so so I think that's it I think that's really interesting because we, we can't just assume that by taking them away it makes it any easier because that, it doesn't necessarily no, I think we all as human beings need a reason to get out of bed in the morning. And I think for young people, especially, they need structure, they need something to aim for. And um, I, I think, yeah, I think not having them has, has been very difficult for a lot of a lot of children. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go on to the next um, uh, the next question. This is my daughter is having a hard time reading some words. And she can't, um, I think she says she can't make them out. What can I do to help her? So this is somebody who's got as far as year 11, but is still struggling with reading. Um, what what advice would you give them, Vicky? Um, well, if there's, I, I suppose, um, without without knowing the specific circumstances, um, my, my initial instinct would be, if your daughter um, is struggling with reading, go and talk to the school. Every school should have some sort of special educational needs coordinator. Um, it's not too late if she hasn't had an educational psychologist assessment to get one of those done. Um, uh, and it's better to do that sooner rather than late, uh, later, because if she were to qualify for some extra time in the exam, she'd need to demonstrate that that was her normal way of working, that she normally had that extra time. Um, uh, so if you're concerned about reading, I mean, that's so critical to so many exams, I would go and talk to the school about it and get some advice from the, the SENCO in, in particular. I think that's quite interesting because some parents may be sitting watching this saying, well, how can that be? But actually, children are really good at bluffing, aren't they? They're really good at, at, mm. at skipping over bits. And, and, yeah. and uh, you know, particularly able, able students, sometimes you can find that learning um, uh, difficulties can sometimes not emerge until they're older. I mean, I've even seen students um, diagnosed with, you know, mild to moderate dyslexia um, at a even in the sixth form, because if, if you're very able, you find coping strategies mm -hmm. and you mask it. And sometimes it'll only be a really, really tough assessment, such as, um, uh, I mean, I remember a student who's, who's learning, whose dyslexia only became evident, and I taught her as a teacher, in fact, but it only became evident when she did a highly, highly pressurized assessment for uh, a US uh, university application. Um, and she just couldn't cope with that speed. And a, a, a light, I had a light bulb moment and I, I said to her parents, I said, I wonder if you've, if you've ever thought about this. And, and it turned out that actually she did qualify for extra time. So Bright often find a way of masking it. That is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the next question is from Jenny Lewis and she's asking, how can I keep my child motivated when learning at home? So she's anticipating another lockdown which I think we're all, you know, we'd love, to, we'd love that not to be true, but, you know, let's, we're in the real world here. Motivation, mm -hmm. Narina, talk to me about how you keep children motivated when learning. Yeah, I think when I talk to adults about motivation, I often talk about energy. And I think it's the same for children as well. But, you know, often we don't have motivation if we're not managing our energy levels. So before you can even start to look at the whole subject of motivation, we need to look at what habits are in place, what lifestyle habits, life skills, routines, rituals are in place to enable us to optimize our energy levels. So I'm looking at they're talking about things like um, protecting the quality of our sleep, making sure we get enough sleep, making sure we're eating healthily, well hydrated, not relying on caffeine, caffeinated drinks, stimulants. And this is relevant for children as well. Um, getting enough fresh air, getting enough exercise. So all of this becomes really important because, you know, the lure of social media and technology for children when they're at home, it's um, 
it's very seductive. It's very easy for them to spend hours looking at screens and looking at the wrong things on screens, you know, not related yeah. to their education. So I think finding the balance in life, in your lifestyle, then you can start to think about, you know, if we've done those things and we've got good habits and routines in place and motivation is still flagging, then there are some deeper conversations, deeper questions that need to be asked about um, the subjects. I mean, this would be perhaps your area, Vicky, but, you know, if children are healthy and well and energized, but still lacking in motivation, then it could be that, you know, it's they're, they're having difficulties with the subjects that they're studying or they're just not terribly enthused by them. So that's a different type of conversation. But I would really cover off those bases to ensure that they're feeling well enough to be motivated. Yeah. V Vicky, do you, would you agree? Yeah. Um, no, I, I absolutely agree with what Narina was saying about routines. I think that's absolutely critical, particularly when, I mean, because schools are such heavily, there's places of such routine and that's very, very comforting to students. Um, it gives them stability, a sense of normality. And when all of that is removed, uh, particularly if children don't have a sort of, you know, a timetable of online learning, and most students didn't, mm. all that routine and structure goes. So I think establishing, I mean, trying to keep your child perhaps on something that looks a little bit like their normal timetable, um, uh, if, they're, if they're learning at home again, um, maybe slightly shorter uh, amounts of time because children's concentration starts to wane, it sort of peaks an individual session will probably peak at about 45 minutes yeah and it starts to wane at about an hour yeah. but if you could sort of encourage them to kind of follow more or less their typical timetable that will give them some structure back i think the other thing about motivation particularly for gcse students is understanding the why you know what is the point of studying uh, this particular subject what is the point of studying hard for my gcse's and maybe getting them to sort of do a little bit of kind of future gazing. You know, what do they want to be doing in a year's time? What do they want to be doing in two years time? And understanding that there are some hoops that they need to, to jump yeah. through. Um, so something we do with our students and any parent can do this for their child. Um, we use Morrisby careers aptitude testing and any individual parents can um, uh, can get a, a, a Morrisby test for their student. They're about, I think, just over 80 pounds. And it assesses you on all sorts of interesting um, ways of thinking. And it also gives some uh, really interesting ideas for careers, which children can then research um, or looking at university courses. So I think having a purpose, I think is really important. Yeah. Uh, just telling them as parents is not gonna work. They've got to find that sense of intrinsic motivation and have something to work for. Yeah. I absolutely um, agree with that. The finding the why is so yeah. important. So it's, important. it's important for all of us, isn't it? It's it's, it's and, and our teenagers are, are young adults, and and so of course mm -hmm. they're they're coming into this whole world of of why. Yeah. Uh, can I also just add to this? Yeah. Know, again, from a physiological perspective, given that I'm a physiologist and looking at the, you know, Vicky, you've talked about the limits of our concentration, and that for children it's like 45 minutes, perhaps an hour. Um, and encouraging them that when they do take breaks, their break isn't a technology break because you really what you want to do is, you know, the concentration, all of us, our concentration dwindles because the working memory becomes saturated with information. So if we're looking at a screen after this, the last thing I want to do is to stay looking at my screen, going onto Facebook and whatever after, I'm going to go out into the rain for a walk with the dog, um, which is lovely, which is the, probably the best thing that I can do to empty my working memory. Yeah. So back I've got more energy and focus so it's important that they're oscillating back and forth between staring at screens or studying and then getting active and get moving and doing something completely yeah. unrelated to uh, yeah. mental mental I, mean, I, I think what's uh, I mean I don't want to predict what's going to happen over the course of this term uh, yeah. but I'm going to have a go yeah um, <laughs> I, I don't I think what was diff really difficult about the summer term for so many students you know, you know, even students um, like the ones in my own school who were lucky enough to have a full timetable online, what was difficult was they didn't have a clear end in sight. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think if students have to learn at home for any length of time now, I mean, we all know that the Department for Education wants to keep them in school. Yeah. So the likelihood is they wouldn't be at home for probably any longer than two weeks. And even if we were to have some sort of second national lockdown or a local lockdown, I hope it would be quite short and sharp. And um, 
you know, I, so I think when they don't have as much time at home to, to deal with, I think, I think they're actually better at coping at it. And I've already seen that we, we sadly had to send a, um, some students home. Uh, so they switched back into online learning. It was, it was incredible, actually, just the flick of a button. But what they said when they came back today, because I went around to talk to them, they, they said it was so much easier than in the summer, mm. because we knew we were coming back today. So yeah. I hope that provides some sort of reassurance. That is good. Um, uh, that on the same kind of theme, Adele Price has asked, "What should I be helping with when my, when my son has missed so many months of schooling?" So she's she's worried. Are there any specific areas that you think you that that, that we should be concentrating on with our children, or do we leave it to the schools? Um, so is, is this a student, I'm guessing a student in years 10 or 11? Yeah. Or, um, yeah. So um, I think there doesn't have to be an element of, of trusting your child's school, because ultimately the teachers are, are the professionals, they know the exam board. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes when parents bring in tutors, the tutors don't necessarily know how the exam board for that particular subject works. Uh, perhaps they're not as used to teaching that age group. You know, some tutors are only just out of university. Um, but uh, so I think on the whole, I would say parents need to trust that the school knows what it's doing. Mm -hmm. In terms of what parents can do, I think by the time students get to years 10 and 11, um, I mean, I'd be really impressed if lots of parents could keep up with all the syllabuses in all the different <laughs> subjects. Personally, I'm already feeling a little bit out of my depth in uh, in year eight maths. Um, so I'm very impressed if you could do that. I think what you can do is offer the supportive frameworks and the routines and, and also to be your child's a sort of coach for your child as well. Um, to, you know, to ask them that when they're not feeling motivated, to ask them and try and sort of drill down with them, what would make them more motivated? What does a good work day look like? And what habits can they stick to? Uh, I mean, other things, what parents could do actually practically in terms of the academic side um, is, you know, helping uh, their children with resources. So you know, any sta good stationery shop is going to have some decent GCSE revision guides. There's all the excellent resources on BBC Bite Size, Oak Academy, um, TED Talks to throw in something that's a bit more inspiring, mm -hmm. um, or uh, you know things like uh, podcasts are fantastic. BBC History podcast, the Geographical Society podcast. So I think parents can maybe act as a little bit of a funnel for some interesting resources. But I wouldn't advise trying to teach the GCSE syllabus. If your child comes down and says, I'd really like you to help me test me on this, that's great. Get involved and, and push that door open, but don't try and force it. Because you may end up closing down the communication. It's interesting you've mentioned tutor because we've got quite a few parents who have contacted with questions about tutors. Um, and I think this is quite interesting because I think if you're a London based parent, this is probably much more on your radar than those yeah. who are outside London in the country. Um, and choose them more normalised in London, I think, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, so uh, do you ever encourage tutoring or do you, again, is it is this something that really, if the school's not doing it, then then that's where you start? Yeah, I mean, I, I think tutoring is a, is a difficult, um, is a difficult topic. And I, you know, I don't think any, any head is going to say, yes, go all out with lots and lots of tutors. But actually, I, whilst I don't, as a general principle endorse tutoring because i think it creates a certain sort of dependency culture um, and i think ultimately what we want is for students to be their own best tutors and to have good enough study skills and good enough learning experiences to be their own best tutors but i do think tutors can be valuable in certain situations so i think if a child reaches a point with a particular subject particularly a cumulative subject like math or languages or sciences um, where they just can't see the wood for the trees and they've totally lost their motivation i think a tutor can be really useful to try and, a bit of a sort of shot in the arm mm -hmm. uh, 
try and give them some sort of strategies. That's what a good tutor should be doing, giving them some strategies, um, helping them to work things out for themselves so that when the tutor's not there, because they can't coach them through all their GCSE revision, they actually know what to do themselves. That's what a good you should be looking for in a good tutor, someone who can essentially make your child more independent. So I think it has some value for children who are struggling, particularly in cumulative subjects. And arguably, maybe at the moment, uh, if, if you will, you know, I, I mean, I think if the, your child has had online lessons, the likelihood is your school is going to be well on track and uh, you don't need to worry. Uh, but if, if your child hasn't had uh, lots of online learning or they've maybe had a really demotivating experience in lockdown, I, th I, I think in this circumstance, even I would be prepared to endorse that potentially yeah. as an idea. It's interesting. One of one of our um, other viewers to, at the moment, one of it is Morris Jones, has just put up on the chat there that um, during the lockdown he spent time as a STEM ambassador, supplementing parental home studying and maths, and that he's also an experienced STEM tutor, tuned into exam boards. So I think maybe as well, if you're going to find a tutor, yeah, there seems to be a bit of a fashion actually at the moment for getting university students, but they're not going to be tuned into any of them, are they? I mean, they may be young and fun, but yeah. 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 So I think I think some questions that parents ask is uh, what experience do they have of tutoring for that particular exam board um, and how recent is that experience and um, uh, see see if perhaps you could get some recommendations as well from maybe they maybe there's another parent that you know and whose opinion you would trust has it worked for their child but I think particularly find out about their exam board experience but it sounds like we've got a very good tutor here in our audience. So. <laughs> Maybe he'll be getting a lot of customers. <laughs> yeah. um, the next question I've got is, um, this. I mean, this one is kind of for both of you again. And oh my God, it's just a classic problem here. Simon Lancaster says, recommended focus techniques. Have we got any recommended focus techniques for catch up and revision given a gaming dependency, which has become even more of a distraction over the past few months? So his child is getting so heavily involved in games, can't get them. And I mean, this it must be just a lot of people's story. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and how te what tips have we got for bringing them back? Yeah, I mean, I, I, when I worked at the Capio Nightingale the psychiatric clinic, I was involved in setting up their adolescent technology addiction center, actually. I mean, that's very extreme. Mm. Um, what I would say is it's it's, the whole thing around technology is there's got to be a family, there's got to be a family buy-in to how we deal with technology in our home, how we manage technology and the boundaries. So, for example, we have a technology basket in our house and it's like the phones go into that at the end of the day. We don't have phones in the bedroom. We don't have any electronic devices in the bedroom. If we're sitting down to watch something on television, we make a decision. We consciously say, this is what we're going to do. We're going to sit and watch this. We're not going to be on our phones as well. We're going to go for a walk. Are we taking phones? Oh, we are taking phones. OK, then. Or we're not taking phones. So there's, there's buy in from everyone and from adults. And as parents, we do need to see the change. It makes it so much more difficult for us to wrench our children away from their devices. If we're not doing that. You know, we're going into the toilets with our phones and things like that. So that's the first thing I would say is to is to lead by lead by example. Um, I would also say again, lifestyle. Certainly, when I was working in the uh, addictions unit, lifestyle is such an important part of this because um, gaming can be very hypnotic, mesmerising. It's uh, you know I don't use the word seductive lightly. It just draws draws them in, and you have to break that. So, encouraging lots and lots of breaks, encouraging a lot of movement making sure that nutrition is good because you can get locked into the energy of this so you forget to eat you forget to drink you, you're not sitting properly so you know sometimes there's a case in which you know we want we want our children to know that we love them more than we need them to like us yeah sometimes there's a bit of tough leadership that's needed and um and and that's all about you know not just leading by example but using the the neuroscience of tough leadership using eye contact using the voice using the phone as I would do with my puppy training and, and having to be quite firm about it. If we're noticing that our children are getting exhausted, are not sleeping well, are actually cancelling social engagements where they're meeting other kids because they just want to stay at home and game, they're withdrawing and their eating patterns are changing. They just want sugary snacks. This is all part of a, a pattern of becoming overly dependent on, yeah. on gaming is the nutrition starts to go out the window, the posture starts to go, the sleep starts to go. That's really interesting, because I think that's one of the things that um, 
uh, with, with the gaming, I think a lot of parents of boys are grateful because the boys talk through the games, don't they? Yes. They're playing a multiplayer. It's their yes. way of having a phone conversation. And, and they're not necessarily talking about the game. They could be talking about girls or, yeah. or worries yeah. or anything. Yeah, yeah. And they're using it as a medium. So, mm. so in that case, it has a purpose. It does. It does. And I, I'll just leave. I know Vicky will want to say something, but I just think it, this is a time where as parents, we have to be extremely conscious. Yeah. And this means gauging with our children, you know, whether the level of communication, you know, my friend often talks about her two boys who game and she can tell from the pitch of their voice and their emotions, whether they've spent too much time gaming yeah. because it starts tipping into aggressive communication. So as parents, you know, we need to be very mindful and it's challenging. You know, if we're running our businesses from home. We're trying to get through our inbox while trying to get our kids off games. But actually, there are times where we have to stop get incredibly present to them. They need 100% of our attention and focus to break the cycle that they might be in. Yeah. Um, uh, um, Vicky, what could you add? I mean, yeah. is this the one that affects girls? I mean, that's the other thing. We, um, we well, I, I, I mean, I, I suppose gaming is something we probably associate more with boys, although some girls do game. Um, I actually think, you know, there are, it's it's not all bad. Yeah. Um, there's, there's actually quite a lot of creativity associated with it. Uh, you know, maybe um, maybe children could, you know, get interested in making some of their own games as well, uh, if, if they're um, aspiring coders. And as you said, Victoria, I think there's a strong element of, of um, socialization and um, uh, communication that happens through uh, gaming, particularly for boys. I mean, what we see with girls, I'm head of a girls' school, is that, um, you know, they will spend, probably the, the risks with girls will be more around things like Instagram, mm -hmm. um, or a lot of conversations on WhatsApp, or FaceTime, uh, house party was the app jewel. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I actually felt sorry for the children who didn't have phones. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I know I sort of, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm a little bit ambivalent about the fact that children as young as 10 have phones. I'm, 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 and I kind of think they have phones because everybody else's parents yeah. have a phone and then they, they have FOMO, don't they? Fear of missing out. Mm -hmm. But actually, I think that phones were a bit of a lifeline for children during lockdown because they kept them in touch with their with their friends. In terms of the gaming question, I mean, I think, as Narina said, it's really about the extent um, of the gaming and whether it's affecting the well-being of um, of, uh, of the child. Um, if it's tipping into addiction, you know, I think that's something that you would need to go and talk to the school about. Um, you know, there are some really good specialist services that can be accessed through CAMS, um, uh, you know, ch uh, Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service, uh, and that might be something we're thinking about if it is really tipping into addiction. Um, and I think otherwise, I endorse everything that Arena said about good habits at home. Yeah. But I have to say, there is no silver bullet in this, and I feel really sorry for 21st century parents. Um, and I say this from personal experience as well. We're expected to work around the clock, mm. and we're worried about our own jobs at the moment, lots of us. Mm. Um, and so, of course, we're working really long hours. And when we're working really long hours, uh, trying to save our businesses or our jobs, it's really hard to find the time to be, as Narina said, present for our children. Yeah. Um, I think there is a bit of that that's going on in lockdown as well. There are children who, who have got sucked into things like gaming and uh, social media and have become rather disconnected from their families because their families are so busy. And I think there's a whole question for employers to be having. I think that's the next stage of sort of work-life balance. Yeah. Um, you know to look at actually how how do people have a good family life now mm. yeah. in which work has crept into the into the home and into yeah. the evenings and this is a cer certainly a conversation that i'm having with a lot of my corporate clients at the moment doing lots of virtual sessions webinars and things about this whole work home balance and um burnout for parents yeah. Because, you know, we, we have to look after ourselves. We yeah. absolutely have to. And I, um, you know, uh, my, fa my family, my daughter and I came unstuck at the end of Mental Health Awareness Week in May because I was booked solid supporting corporate clients and yeah. thinking, got to take the work because I don't yeah. know when it's going to stop happening. So yeah. I was running program after program, more disconnected from my daughter. And actually, we got into June and had to sit down and do some repair. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Yeah.
Absolutely. So as we care for ourselves, and I think it does have, you know, the, the cliched oxygen mask theory, you know, you put your oxygen mm -hmm. mask on first. It really is important. It's really difficult to do sometimes. Yeah. We do need to hold certain things as being non-negotiable for ourselves and our parents and how we look after ourselves so that we've got the energy and the resilience and we exude that within the culture of our home. Yeah. And, you know, just little things like when you wake up in the morning, if you're waking up with anxiety as a parent, eat breakfast, don't rely yeah. on the caffeine, don't skip food, look after yourself physically, reach out to your own support network so your children don't become your support yeah. network. That's an important one. If you go, my daughter's a great listener, very empathetic. But she can't be my counsellor or my coach. No, no exactly. Um, well, that brings me on to what, one of our next questions, which is um, a parent um, said to us, my child seems to be nocturnal. They don't go to bed until midnight. Then mm -hmm. you can't browse them in the morning. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I'm so tired, I go to bed before they do. So I can't even stay mm -hmm. up late anymore to make sure they go into bed because it's killing me. Yeah. So it's a really difficult one. I'm assuming you're directing some of that at me, at me Victoria. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Really difficult one. We have to kind of pick pick our battles as parents. You know, it was certainly easier to influence, stroke, manipulate my daughter when she was 14, 15 than when she turned 16. Yeah. But again, encouraging, leading by example, but also checking things like, you know, are they eating breakfast in the morning within half an hour, 45 minutes of getting up? Because often the pattern I've noticed is a fatigue cycle where you're not eating breakfast. So just physiologically, you're not producing enough melatonin. It's difficult to get to sleep. So you start going to bed later and the combination of the blue light and the, the lower melatonin levels mean, you know, you start delaying your, your sleep phase and then it perpetuates you waking up later, you're skipping breakfast. So little things like encouraging them. And I, you know, there are times when I'm, I would make sure that my daughter was, I have a variety of things that she can eat in the morning, even down to just nuts and dried fruit and things like that. So it doesn't have to be huge breakfast, yeah. but just breaking the fast, breaking the fatigue slump and getting yeah. into the routine of encouraging that. Um, and and then there comes a point where you have to maybe walk away, and hard as that can be, because you want to keep them on side. And if you're yelling and screaming and shouting about bedtime routines as they're getting older, you you may well lose them. Yeah, you know, break that the communication may break down. So maybe maybe buy them a decent book. And I know you write books about mm -hmm. but give them a good book with advice in uh, about sleep, and then go and get some sleep yourself. Yeah, and, and you know there are some there are some good apps. There's a particularly good app, and I'm not on commission or anything to this. But the um, Moshi have got a, a, an app that you can listen to bedtime stories. Yeah, and um, they're they're great, and even the older children listen to them as well. So you know if they if they're getting anxious because of everything that's going on or picking up on our anxiety, just encouraging them to think about what they read or what they watch before they go to bed. And um, we all, even us, as, you know, as adults, we need a perfect bedtime story. We need to go to bed feeling safe, yeah. feeling safety. And while there's so much talk around us at the moment on the news, on media about, you know, we're not safe. And it's, it's the slogan, of stay safe. You know, it's very easy for that to creep in to the nervous system and they can't go to sleep because they don't feel they don't have inner safety and it's harder to get to sleep. Well, that's really interesting. My daughter and I started listening to Jane Austen on um, audiobooks mm -hmm. lockdown. And at first, my daughter couldn't, she couldn't take the slow pace of it. It was like, you know, more things happening. Um, and eventually, by the end of it, she was absolutely loving it. And both of us were sitting there, it's like being in a lovely warm bath, yeah. listening to chat quietly. And, you know, it was really mellowing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so something like that that's mellowing, a milky drink. You know, yeah. some toast with nut butter, all of which will help, the, you know, to, to get the sleep cycle going. Um, breathing techniques, gratitude exercises, little yeah. things like this, which, which really affect your, your physiology, wow. um, really help to calm the physiology. Um, and so if they want to talk about their anxieties, perhaps encouraging that in the earlier part of the evening, if you can, and then before they go to bed, you know, something like, you know, what was what was good about today? What did you enjoy with your conversation with so and so? Just encouraging them without being too obvious about it to put them in that place of safety with, um, you know, think, feeling grateful, feeling good about life. Yeah. 
what do you what do you think vicky have you got anything that you could bring to that add to um, that? i really like the idea of what marina was saying about sort of you know thinking about what's what you're grateful for and what's gone well mm. um because uh when students come home from school they often have a bit of a rant don't they and they <laughs> yeah. off the road yeah. And I think, I mean, I think it's really important that parents listen to that because that's actually probably, you know, if they've managed to offload, then they've they've sort of got rid of some of that stress and maybe that will help them to go to sleep a little bit later. Mm -hmm. But if worry is keeping them awake, I think sort of writing down things that are worrying them, somehow you can you can feel that you can control yeah. your worry list a little bit better if you if you write it down. But um, I'm really impressed that you've been listening to uh, Jane Austen with your daughter Victoria and um, yes I mean I always worry if I'm still asleep when the shipping forecast if I'm still awake when the shipping <laughs> comes on and it's always really depressing if I'm awake when farming today comes on on radio four I sort of I regard that as the barometer of how much sleep I've had but um, but there's some brilliant podcasts that you can listen to which and actually I think that's a really soothing way of going to sleep because it takes your mind off of it and you can listen to something else I think that's a great recommendation well that also brings in somebody else has written in to say is it okay at the other end of the scale for teenagers to use stimulants like coffee or pro plus to get them through the exam learning yeah it's it's really not ideal and in fact i think it was a couple of years ago i did a, a, sh a show with um jamie jamie oliver on their friday feast and we went into a school in streatham and we looked at uh, children's you know habits eating habits energy levels sleep patterns cognitive performance you know their ability to concentrate and a lot of the kids weren't eating breakfast in the morning they were stopping off and buying their lucasades and their lucasade sports and things on the way into school and it's really not ideal I mean, if you look at the studies with caffeine i mean i love my cups of tea as much as anybody else but i regulate my, my caffeine intake um but you know the studies with caffeine is it, they looked at i think simulated switchboard operators you know above a certain amount of caffeine it increases reaction time but it doesn't increase your ability to retain information and to make um, connections between complex, you know, different areas of the brain. So it's not really good for solving complex problems and memory retention, but fast reaction time, just pressing a button and maybe for, I don't know, I don't, don't know enough about actual gaming itself. It might actually improve performance, but I wouldn't encourage it, to be honest. You know, what we want to do is look at eating patterns, Look at activity levels, look at hydration, look at movement and taking regular breaks. And bearing in mind that even though we've talked about concentration spans and lessons, 45 minutes to an hour, I remember as a child, I probably would have been diagnosed as having some sort of attention deficit disorder or something like that. I don't, but I know this about myself, which is that I like to be quite active when I'm learning. I like to get up and I like to move. I'll often take regular breaks i drink lots of water which makes me take breaks and so paying attention to your children if they were working from home they may have shorter concentration spans and like to study walking around or standing up and if they're at home then they have the luxury of being, being able to do that rather than sitting getting slumpy and thinking i need to force myself to concentrate so maybe i do need pro plus or something maybe they need to move or, or study standing up and moving around with, with more car or something what Vicky, what do you think? Yeah, I, I always think when they go on study leave and they have sort of that unstructured time, I mean, my advice is that they try and um, uh, put in as many hours of work as they would in a typical school day and to replicate that. But I always try and encourage them to start some revision in the morning, not necessarily a sort of brutal eight o'clock start. I'm not quite that. <laughs> Yeah. and I know that they like their sleep but I think it's actually quite important that they do something in the morning because there's that afternoon slump isn't yeah. there yeah um, sort of two o'clock our circadian rhythms you know make up a bit sleepy so I think a sort of burst of work in the morning on study leave is really beneficial and it makes them feel that they've sort of they've actually achieved something I think it puts them in a much better mood if they manage to crack something in the morning mm -hmm. and then come back to it sort of later on in the afternoon um I think there's something quite depressing about only starting your work at kind of two o'clock in the afternoon yeah. and that's yeah. the worst time mentally to be yeah. starting it. Yeah, and I think that's such a good point. And, you know, they all have different concentration energy profiles. And when they're at home, you can encourage them to learn more about that. But 
most mm. children will have a peak in the morning and then it will start to dip. So it oscillates within the circadian rhythm. There's a shorter cycle called the ultradian, which is the limits of our ability to concentrate. And for children, as you said, it's around 45 minutes, 45 minutes to an hour or so. Um, allowing themselves to be a little bit tired mid-afternoon. And interestingly, that might be the best time for them to move more, to actually get some exercise in. Yeah. Yeah. Something else that might be, I mean, this is not related to the sleep or the stimulants issue, but I think it's, it's maybe worth mentioning as we're talking about kind of how you structure your day once you sort of get into the revision period, is um, when your child is writing their revision timetable, it's actually a really good idea for them to mix subjects up um, I remember when I was at school, we used to sort of talk about having my history day or the biology day, and that's actually not a very good idea. It's much better to mix things up because what you're then practicing is uh, retrieval um, because you're forcing yourself to go back over things every time you revisit them and you're much more likely to remember them. Um, so uh, if your child creates a revision timetable where they're just doing whole days of certain subjects, suggest that they mix things up that's actually much better for their learning that's interesting um, i've got another question here, and this one's about sport um uh we've got um, a reader who's written in and said my daughter's a talented athlete um but she's complaining of growing pains at night and is now refusing to do her normal sport she missed out a lot in lockdown um how can i get her back on the way to physical recovery should i push her through this as i think she could be really successful but we have to get through this dip. Um, and I think we've all seen that children who've got, you know, things like dance or sport, they've really struggled with this to get be able to get the time in the sheer hours that they used to be doing. And they've lost fitness, they've lost skills, and they've lost time at a really crucial moment. How do we deal with that? Vicky, what do you... What yeah. Do you um, well, I suppose I think that if your daughter is a really talented athlete who loves her sport, Personally, I mean, I think it's a really difficult decision as a parent. Do you do you do you push them through, or do you or do you do you sort of listen to what they're saying now? But I suppose as a parent, you've got a role to try and think about the long game as well. And arguably, you you know your child even better than they know themselves. And I think if they really loved their sport before, I think it would be a shame for them to sort of give that give that up now. Um, and I think it's I think sports, um, uh, you know, sort of very talented athletes are probably having a particularly difficult time at the moment because, of course, of all the restrictions yeah. of COVID, um, the relative lack of fixtures, of competitions, that's all really difficult for them. Um, so I think if they loved it before, I think really get them to think about whether they, they want to sort of um, let go of that. I think as well as thinking about how sport can be a useful motivation for other areas of your of your child's life as well because if they've shown that ability to be really motivated in one area of their life i think there are so many useful transferable skills yeah. that can help as they approach their gcses um i mean in the end it's, it's up to you and your your child about what you do about that it's a tricky one but um maybe maybe it's a bit like you know if you've been out of kind of if you've been out of training for a long time if you're a runner that hasn't been training for a long time it takes time to get back into it and it's not going to be easy at first and that's the same with learning and maybe that's similar with your daughter's athletic performance but if it's fundamentally her passion i think it would be a shame to see that go personally is it something as well that you know talk to the sports teachers talk to her coaches absolutely absolutely it becomes a, a fight between you and your child when you don't want the fight to be there you want the fight to be mm -hmm. over here yeah, and sports coaches will be really, I mean, they are some of the best people at sort of understanding the psychology of motivation. Um, you know, they're often real experts in it. So I think getting them to have a conversation with your daughter, I think it's probably relatively common for athletes, you know, talented athletes to go through peaks and troughs of motivation. And um, maybe even just knowing that there are other young athletes out there who are feeling those same feelings of demotivation, I think would could be reassuring. Yeah. Um, I've noticed that we're actually hitting our time, but just before we, we close, I just wondered if there's any of the questions that in the chat that we could quickly address. I noticed that um, Jenny Spick has said, what about studying, listening to Spotify and music at the same time or watching something at the same time? I'm thinking no, but Sun is, says it's okay. He says he's studying at the same time. 
should I should I pick this one up? Yeah. Uh, yes, we we have um, a, a teacher at school who's who's uh, who sort of looks after. She, you know, she's very interested in cognitive um, science, and um, I asked her the same question. I was very much hoping that she would say no. Music <laughs> is not good for studying. Mm. But um, like all good researchers, she gave me a slightly ambivalent answer. <laughs> it depended. It depended on the music. Yeah. Um, I think Mozart and, and Bach and music to a sort yeah. of certain beat were fine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, something sort of very fast, violent, not so mm. good. So no uh, time. Also depends on the child. Yeah. If the child fundamentally cannot concentrate without some sort of you know music in the background, then that's okay. I think watching things, I'm really not sure how that would work. Yeah. That feels to me like an absolute no. Yeah. You yeah. Your son. Do you agree? I, I no. completely uh, watching things not not ideal, but music no. certain frequencies and you know things that is called binaural beats or EMDR yeah. music you know of a certain frequency and I've I've even tried sometimes I write to um, music of a particular frequency on Spotify um, and it's binaural beats and it, it's fairly bland music yeah. but it really does help you and it's sort of one ear and then goes to the next one and it's um, it, it yeah. alternates between the two and it does do something very specific for cognitive performance um but as you said Vicky and your 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 teacher said she's absolutely right it has to be a particular frequency <laughs> um, I noticed Andrew Hayward has put up here the availability of the wi-fi is the power over my son so he's talking about the gaming question oh, okay. the wi-fi just for them the bonus being they get gaming speed and not mum and dad speed um, the flip side is it's scheduled to help kick them towards bed or if needed better behavior. What a great idea, Andrew. Yeah. Um, and uh, um, Bhavani says, will all schools be telling the students what is happening about exams in October? So we're back, real worried about this exam question. Yeah, I, I'm sure schools will be informing students about it. It's going to be all over the media at some stage soon. And uh, there will be, I mean, there is information fairly freely available on exam board websites. So I would have thought that year 11 students, they should know which syllabuses they're studying. Um, and uh, and the exam boards will have that publicly available on their websites about what's changed if parents um, want to sort of double check things themselves. But mm -hmm. I'd be surprised if schools were not communicating that in, in some detail to their to their candidates. And I'm sure there will be lots of discussion about it in the media. Okay, excellent. Well, look, um, thank you both so much, Narina and Vicky. Thank you so much for coming thank along you. and sharing your knowledge with everybody tonight. Um, and thank you to everyone at home who's who's um, taken time to listen and send your questions in. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll see you again. Good night.